I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, I think I give a lot of lectures, particularly to students and to at conferences, but my favorite time to give a lecture is to patients, because you guys are really why we do what we do. And I'm really grateful uh, for Dr. Hu and Dr. Kim for inviting me here to speak with you today. These are just some of my uh, conflicts of interest. I want to start off with a story. I know, has anybody read uh, The Emperor of All Maladies by Sudhathi Mukherjee? If you guys haven't read it, it's a Pulitzer Prize uh, nonfiction uh, history of uh, the history of cancer drug development. It's a fascinating book. And so I want to start out with a story. And this is a picture of <clears throat> the port of Bari in 1943. So um, I don't know if you, anybody here is a World War II veteran or anything like that. But in December 2nd, 1943, uh, the U.S. Allied, the Allied forces were amassing uh, ships and troops in the southern port of Italy. And I think they were hoping that Mussolini and, and uh, the Germans, Hitler, would not find out about it, but unfortunately they did. And uh, the German Air Force, uh, uh, Luftwaffe, bombed uh, all these forces and all these ships that were being amassed here. It was the biggest defeat of the Allied forces uh, since Pearl Harbor at that time. Thousands of uh, American soldiers and Allied forces died, but there were many soldiers, several, uh, uh, about 100 soldiers, who although they were not physically damaged, had died several days later of shock. <clears throat> Obviously, this was concerning because they didn't know why these soldiers had died. So they sent in a young um, medical officer by the name of Thomas Darty, um, who went in and investigated what exactly was happening. He took samples. He interviewed some of the soldiers who were still alive. And he found out that these soldiers had been clearly exposed to some kind of chemical warfare which had already been outlawed after World War I. Many of them had shared that they had smelt a very intense garlic smell. And their white counts were wiped out. Their platelets were wiped out. All this information, Tom Stardy uh, kind of collected and sent to his superior, who was Colonel P. Rhodes. Now, Colonel P. Rhodes was the head hemopathologist at Memorial Hospital, which is now Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he was on loan to the US Army at that time. And at that time, in 1943, there was no chemotherapy for cancer, none. You had surgery, and then you had the experimental radiation therapy that was emerging. But there was no known chemotherapy or any type of medication for uh, approved yet for cancer. And Colonel P. Rhodes, just like many of the uh, scientists back then, were searching for something that would maybe work in their patients. And he saw this report come in from Thomas Darty, and he had an aha moment. The problem with his cancer patients, many of the leukemic patients, many of the lymphoma patients, were that they had the opposite problem, right? They had too many white cell counts. They had too many lymphocytes in their body. And he thought, Maybe, maybe we can use this nitrogen mustard, this chemical warfare, on cancer patients to fight their cancer. So he commissioned Goodman and Gilman at Yale to create derivatives of nitrogen mustard and do the first in vivo experiments to test this. And it showed remarkable responses in these, <coughs> these uh, animal models. This went on to, in 1940. Uh, five or six, I think, the first phase one clinical trial in oncology. It was called Project X. It was a secret study that was done in several places in the United States. And I think here at MD Anderson, the first person who actually, who was the PI of this study was actually a surgeon. And they did these experiments and they found, indeed, a dose that was safe, but also that they showed that this was 
uh, effective in subsets of lymphoma patients. And this became, in 1949, the first drug ever approved for cancer therapy. It was called Mustagrin. It was a derivative of nitrogen mustard, and it was marketed by Merck and Company. So since 1949, there's been an explosion of many new, you know, figuratively an explosion of many new uh, therapies since then. This is a mile-high view of the Port of Bari in southern Italy. I've never been to Italy myself. Someday, maybe if I ever go to Italy, I'll go visit this place. But today, I really want to give you guys this mile-high view, an overview of the drug development process and how complicated it is. Um, and what are some of the trends and the problems in getting these new drugs to cancer patients in general? But what are the promises of these new drugs in cancer? So you guys all know this. Uh, obviously, many of you are probably melanoma patients with some, or, 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 or have a family member who are affected. Cancer is the, is the disease, is truly the emperor of all maladies. In 2012, I think, it became the leading cause of death in the world. Not tuberculosis, not malaria. Cancer became the leading cause of death in the world. And all of us are going to be affected by it. One in three of us at some point will get cancer. It may not be melanoma, but it may be something else. And that will lead to <clears throat> our death. So it is not something that is just maybe in the back corner or somewhere. It is, will affect all of us and all of our families. But <clears throat> since 1949, at that time, you know, uh, as, as brilliant as Dr. Rhodes and I'm sure uh, Dr. Goodman and Gilman were, they had very little understanding of what caused cancer. What was the molecular underpinnings of cancer? But since then, in the last 60 years, we have started to understand and unravel this black box of what makes cancer and drives cancer. So <clears throat> if you talk to some of uh, the old timers, they'll say, you know, nitrogen mustard, even though it was a safe drug, even though it was a, 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 the first drug, it was not that effective of a drug, literally. Patients would get the drug for a period of time, and then they would again uh, 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 recur and die from their disease. But what is really exciting is, is that all these drugs are emerging that will, I think, for the first time, maybe even cure cure, and I, I dare say the word, cure patients with metastatic disease. And if you would have asked me in 2002, when I was a, a medical oncology fellow here, if we would cure metastatic disease, I probably would have been doubtful. But as, do, as all your previous speakers have shared here, there is hope. There is hope that some of these new drugs will truly may transform how cancer is treated, not only how cancer is treated, but how all of medicine will treat patients down the line. So these are just some of the small list of new drugs that have emerged. Let me give you, uh, again, a mile high view of what are the steps in the drug development process of a cancer drug. So in most drugs, <coughs> it starts in the lab. Whether it's a lab here at MD Anderson or whether it's a lab at a big pharmaceutical company at um, like Abbott or Pfizer or or Merck, it starts in a lab. Usually these drug companies have huge libraries of thousands of different types of molecules. They usually place a patent on these molecules so that their competitors cannot take uh, their molecule and then run with it. And if, if, a, if a drug is developed here, for example, in a lab here at MD Anderson, an academic center, usually they license this out to other drug companies. They license it out to a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company because the costs of, and as I will show you, the costs of developing a drug are astronomic, are astronomic. Eventually, it moves into this development and approval and commercialization stage. And the process itself, on average, and now things may be changing, but on average, takes 16 years, 16 years for a drug to be 
from point of discovery to actual FDA approval. From the point of entering into a phase one clinical trial to actual uh, uh, FDA approval on average, as we know of since 2008, which Dr. Demasi, I'll show you the data on that, was about nine years. I don't know about you, I see patients who do not have nine years to wait for new drugs. And so why it takes nine years is a very, very complicated answer to a very complicated question. But I'll try to touch on some of the reasons why. So usually it goes into discovery. There is what's called preclinical testing. A drug has to meet certain criteria on toxicity, purity, et cetera. Something called an investigational new drug application is filed with the FDA, then usually a phase one, then a phase two, and then usually a large phase three study is conducted, which then goes through, again, a very rigorous process of analyzing that data by the FDA and by committees actually outside of the FDA, experts who come in called the ODAC committee meeting to evaluate whether or not that data is truly real. And then uh, through this whole process of kind of FDA approval where they have to label the drug and then determine how it's going to be marketed. So again, that process itself takes about 16 years. After that, <clears throat> The FDA uh, gives that drug company or that pharmaceutical company something called drug exclusivity, data exclusivity. And that's, that's a life beyond the patent. A usual patent lasts 20 years. But because drug development takes so long for a drug to be developed, the FDA will give what's called data exclusivity. So a generic will not be able to be made on that drug almost up to 12.5 uh, years beyond the approval of that drug, even though the patent may have already kind of lapsed. <clears throat> so this is the hurdle that uh, most drug companies and pharmaceutical companies have to overcome, and that is the FDA. I don't know if you know, the FDA controls 25% of our economy. 25% of our economy, food, drugs, et cetera, right? They, uh, medical devices, everything that you can think of, they control 25% of the economy, or at least they're the, they oversee 25% of the economy. And primarily, this area, the Center for Drug Evaluation and the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research are the two branches of the FDA in which these drug approvals have to overcome. I don't know if you guys remember this. This is the BP disaster, right? Um, that was big news here, uh, uh, here in Houston, obviously, because we were really in the thick of things. The history of the FDA is a lot like the oil industry. Um, the more I have friends, some friends and engineers who are in the oil industry, and the more I talk to them about how complex finding oil is, I understand, and also I understand kind of the regulations that they have to go through. Uh, essentially, is in many ways, it's similar to what the oil industry goes through, and that is, um, there have been really kind of tragedies that have arisen over the history of the FDA that has led to uh, certain restrictions, certain regulations, and ultimately these hurdles that, uh, 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 that the FDA has imposed for better or for worse. So the FDA was formed in 1902. There was something called the Biological Controls Act. I don't know if you guys remember reading in high school, Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair was a muckraker, and he would write these stories of injustices in society. He wrote a story about a horse named Jim. And Jim was, back then, they would inoculate horses with certain you know, infectious, age, uh, infectious diseases, and then take their serum and give it back to humans to kind of immunize them from those uh, infections. Well, there was no oversight over this, and one of these horses actually had tetanus, and it killed uh, several uh, hundreds of, uh, like a hundred some people and children included. And when you have children who are dying from this, uh, Upton Sinclair wrote about this, and there was a guy by the name of ha Harvey Wiley in the Theodore uh, Roosevelt administration who said, we need to put regulations on this. This cannot happen. So in 1906, the Food and Drug Act was created, 
which was called the uh, uh, Harvey Wiley Act. And essentially what it did was it, it restricted uh, transportation of medications and cosmetics across state lines without approval, right? And to a large extent, that's what the FDA has authority over. Um, that led to 1930 an expansion of that law, which said uh, there needs to be some kind of pre-market safety of any drug or cosmetic before you actually market the drug in the United States. And that's why in 1946, when that uh, mustergrin was done, it was only, the only requirement was actually a phase one study. It was not a phase two or even a phase three clinical trial. In 1959, something happened. Some of you may remember this. There was something called thalidomide. And thalidomide was a drug that people thought was good for insomnia. They would give this drug to women who were pregnant in Europe. And some of these drugs ended up here in the United States. And of course, these children were born without arms and legs. And this led to something called the Kefhar Harris Amendment. And this amendment gave the FDA the authority not only to expand the power of the FDA, but said every drug not only have to be safe, but they must prove that they're actually efficacious. And so this led to phase two and larger phase three studies. Hatch and Waxman, uh, Senator Hatch is actually still in, I think, uh, the Senate. In 1984, they had the same problems that we're still having now, and that's health care costs. And one of them was drug costs. And this led to the development uh, of the Hatch and Waxman Act, which allowed for generics to be approved only with one condition. They didn't have to do phase one, two, three studies. All they had to do was prove that the molecule was exactly similar to the agent that was coming off of the um, uh, uh, patent. Lastly, in the 1990s, um, many of you probably remember this, because I remember this in medical school. All we talked about in medical school was HIV. And you don't hear about it anymore anymore, right? And part of it is, is because in the 1990s, the HIV activists got together and they insisted that the FDA make some changes to the drug development approval process. I remember I was on an airplane coming home from medical school and I read this Time magazine and you see this HIV activist throwing blood or paint on an FDA official as he's walking into uh, calling murder, right? And that got things ball rolling and things such as what's called the IND exemption, accelerated approval and parallel track were instituted. But, uh, uh, but again, like I said, I'll tell you, at least in oncology, some of these things have yet to uh, really uh, lead to um, uh, drug approval. So why is this such a problem? Well, part of it has to do with the regulatory uh, environment. This is, a, this is a picture of the traffic at Hurricane Ike. <laughs> and people have argued that all these government agencies that have been involved have led to all these cost delays, et cetera. But that's not really the only issue. Um, it has to do with just science in general. Um, one could argue that many of us uh, in academic institutions and research are actually rewarded to do safe science, not necessarily groundbreaking science. Um, the, other, uh, uh, the other problem is, is that patients do not like to uh, enroll in clinical trials. And the participation rate of cancer patients, not necessarily pediatric cancer patients, in the United States is less than 4%, okay? So part of the problem is if you're not enrolling patients and you can't finish these trials, it takes that longer. Um, there are other reasons uh, as to, you know, part of the problem is, is trials where they randomize people. This is a, a New York article, Times article by Amy Hammond that was done about two twin brothers who both came down with melanoma. And they were, one was randomized to this life-saving drug called vamurafenib. The other one had to be, had to be uh, randomized to placebo. Right. So in the end, the, the drug process takes, it's, it's a risky venture. If you want to do risky investment, go into drug development. Out of 10,000 molecules that are screened preclinically, maybe one of them will eventually get, uh, IRB, uh, will get FDA approval. The estimated cost in 2003 was about a billion dollars. They think now that to get one drug approval, it's going to be about 2.5 billion dollars. 
And why is that cost so exorbitant? Again, part of it is this regulatory uh, delay, but it's also all these other factors. The promise, though, is, is that we are moving towards an era of personalized cancer therapy, where these trials will be smaller and the, and the, eff uh, the efficacy will be greater. And personalized cancer therapy is here. Uh, Dr. Hu and, and some, some of the auth uh, authors have here have already probably shared with you a lot of the data. In our clinic, we, what, we do a molecular profile of every patient who comes into our clinic, 46 genes, several hundred mutations. We are moving in October to over 400 genes. And I, our hope is, is that as these new molecules emerge, we will be able to match people with the right target. And this is where oncology medicine is going. Partly because in 2002, when they first sequenced the human genome, it cost $2.2 billion. If you want your genome sequenced now, you can go online in the web and you can probably get it for about $5,000. It's a lot of information. We're not quite sure what to do with all of this. But it's led to these drugs where we're seeing these incredible responses. These are just some of them. This is some of these cases in our clinic, et cetera. And we've done an analysis now where we've clearly shown, in our clinic at least, that if we can match these patients with the right drug, their likelihood of responding is four times better than if you do not. So let me end here. I know we're short on time. Many of you have gone through a lot of suffering. Many of you have gone through a lot. And I just want to end with this message. There is hope. These new drugs are coming out there. And, and like I said, in 2002, if you had told me that we may be curing metastatic disease, I would have laughed at you. But we are, we are, we are uh, heading towards that. And so um, thank you for, again, uh, letting me speak. <clears throat>